Hi, I'm Weston Labar. Welcome to another episode of People on the Move, a Cargomatic podcast. We're here today for the Freight Year in Review to recap all of the fun times we've had in 2023. But to start, where did we start the year? At the end of 2022, we saw a massive migration of freight from the U.S. West Coast ports to the Gulf Coast and East Coast ports. We saw shippers frantically trying to make sure that they had enough stock on their shelves and online so shoppers would have the products that they wanted during the holiday season. And as we head into 2023, we see a huge economic shift away from the purchase of durable goods and a migration back to a services economy. Here's Chris Saltmeyer, former EVP of supply chain for Walmart, talking about this situation. The durable goods, and to get specific, outdoor patio, lawn and garden type stuff, um, that furniture, the big bulky, the televisions, all of those things were such in over demand during the pandemic, during the staycation season and everything else. That demand, the supply could not keep up with that demand. People just went after those goods. Every retailer chased those goods. And suddenly when you had us coming out of the pandemic and all of that stuff really starting to flow well, then suddenly demand cut off and demand shifted more to the service industries because suddenly people said, you know, I want to get out. I want to travel. I want to eat out. I want to do other things. I've already got my stuff. Now, suddenly all of that stuff is sitting there and it's literally taking retailers 18 months or so to go through that. Another key topic at the beginning of the year was agility and resiliency, right-sizing the supply chain. With the enormous amount of goods coming into the country at the end of 2022 and in the beginning of 2023, supply chains became extremely congested. Why is that? We're an ecosystem that must function together. And a lot of the product that came in to support retailers during the holiday season was not consumed because of the switch to services. Here's Beth Ann Rooney, executive director for the Port of New York, New Jersey, talking about this issue. When we started the Council at Port Performance, it, it is a resiliency initiative. It is how does the Port of New York and New Jersey withstand a disruption? It could be a labor issue. It could be a trucking issue. It could be a hurricane. It could be a pandemic, right? It's about creating resiliency within the ecosystem that, that we control, but we don't control it all. So you're absolutely right, Weston. We have got to, we have got to get the national freight players and everybody in the movement of goods, because this is what our economy depends upon. Um, and yes, we're a much larger importing country than we are, you know, as an exporting country. But even when we reshore, um, look, and everything is working well, and we reshore, when we reshore and we supply, you know, our own people, we're still going to want to produce for others. So maybe there's a change in which we are more of an exporting nation, but you still have to have a free transportation system that works efficiently. And, and we're not quite there yet. Another key topic in the beginning of the year was the economy. Our economy was shifting away from a goods economy and back to the traditional services economy, which created ripple effects throughout the supply chain. Some of the key bottlenecks were at warehouses and distribution center, and basically any place that freight could be stored, including container yards and pop-up yards throughout the country. Here's John Wolf, executive director and CEO of the Northwest Seaport Alliance, talking about concerns around a rebound in Q2 and Q3, concerns the federal government has around inflation, and just the overall transition the economy was taking and things that we needed to look out for. We're seeing uh, a declining U.S. import demand, um, it, 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 certainly first quarter this year. I expect that we'll uh, rebound second half of the year. Um, I think second quarter is still going to be uh, soft, although um, slightly better than first quarter. Um, you know, higher interest rates continue to uh, affect the uh, consumer market, and um, I, I um, happen to sit on the uh, Seattle. Uh, board of the uh, Federal Reserve Bank. So I have some insight there as to how the Fed's looking at things. And we read about that as well. So it, it, it's, uh, I know um, the federal government is concerned about inflation. 
And uh, so we'll see where that goes. But uh, I am optimistic uh, that things are going to land on solid footing here the second half this year. As freight volumes dropped in the beginning of the year due to the response of having a surplus of goods and over inventory throughout the supply chain, we started to see job loss as well. Less truckers, less warehouse workers, as the supply chain began to right size for what the new normal would be. The great activity we saw throughout the global supply chain during the pandemic was coming to an end. And we started to see the reporting of what would become tens, if not hundreds of thousands of jobs lost throughout the supply chain in 2023. On a positive note, as import volumes began to wane, export volumes for cargo destined to leave the United States began to see an uptick, something that policymakers in the federal government and state governments have been asking for for quite some time throughout the pandemic, a focus on our exporters. As this shift occurred, we have a clip from Peter Friedman who talked about the challenges exporters faced getting the right type of equipment, whether that be empty ocean containers or access to the right type of supply chain infrastructure to actually export their goods. If you can have the ocean carriers bringing containers to those inland locations, so much better for the agriculture exporters because then they'll truck maybe only 100 miles to get a container, bring it back to the plant, load it, and take it. And then, as you say, it gets loaded on the train. And often, that's the end of your troubles because it gets on the train. And if it's on the carrier's through bill of lading there, it'll go. It's the carrier's problem and opportunity to get that rail to go on dock, uh, on dock rail into the port and on the ship. But there's a challenge. How do we get the empty containers to those inland sites? And we have challenges that we've been speaking at the highest level with the ocean carriers. It's still not financially viable to reposition an empty container from Los Angeles to Omaha. Another major challenge in 2023 was the overcapacity of ocean shipping. As volume decreased, the need for ocean shipping decreased at the same time that many new vessels were coming online, creating a complete imbalance from a supply demand perspective, further causing the plummeting of ocean rates and creating a new ecosystem to where there was much more space available on ships than what shippers needed the complete opposite of what they had been dealing with the previous two years. The global shipping industry is built on a supply and demand business model. Ocean carriers have a certain amount of space or capacity on their vessels, and there's a certain amount of shipping volume transacting throughout the global supply chain. In the beginning of 2023, we saw a massive amount of new volume come online. Essentially, new ships had been deployed at the same time that global volumes of cargo were starting to decline. This resulted in a massive drop of shipping rates that we had been seeing on the Trans-Pacific from Asia to the U.S. West Coast due to a decrease in demand that continued throughout 2023, but this time we saw the effects hit the U.S. Gulf Coast and East Coast, meaning that shipping rates throughout the U.S. were starting to see a downward trend or spiraling effect. Here again is John Wolf, CEO of the Northwest Seaport Alliance, talking about the massive drop in shipping rates impacting global trade from countries like Asia to the U.S. West Coast, East Coast, and Gulf Coast ports. We are seeing on the ocean side significant reduction in shipping costs, um, which is good for uh, cargo owners. Um, and um, it'll be interesting to watch that because uh, the carriers uh, have uh, new builds they're introducing into the marketplace starting this year. And it's going to be interesting to see how those carriers uh, respond to uh, the supply demand needs and balancing that so that they can maintain somewhat healthy rates. Um, from my perspective, uh, super high rates like we saw last year or very low rates uh, are not sustainable in the market. I think we all benefit from uh, a rates that um, are competitive in the market, yet allow the carriers to continue to invest and add more service offerings. Another key trend that people are keeping their eyes on is the migration away from China. During the Trump administration, 
tariffs were administered on China that created a shift of manufacturing sometimes away from mainland China to other areas of Southeast Asia. But as we saw during the pandemic, the longer that supply chains are, the more complicated they can be. Nearshoring in Mexico has become a hot topic, both because of the Mexican ports, the growth that they're seeing, but as well as the emergence of the Mexican economy and American companies being more willing to nearshore closer to home and take landside transportation solutions as the primary way of moving their cargo, not needing to be as reliant on traditional forms of ocean and air shipping. Here's Andrew Clark, former CFO of CH Robinson and advisor to Cargomatic, talking about nearshoring in Mexico and the impacts it could have on the U.S. supply chain. One other thing, though, that, that I'm spending a lot more of my time on today is that re and that nearshoring aspect, uh, Mexico, and the ability for organizations to develop. Uh, I just spent uh, 10 days uh, down in Mexico between Torreon and Mexico City um, looking at uh, logistics operations down there, as well as kind of that end market consumer. They've got some really good demographic trends that are very long-term and very positive, not only for the Mexican economy itself, but for the Mexican to cross-border U.S. economy that I think uh, is going to play out over the next decade. And, and so it does kind of argue for more of a West Coast uh, focus, as well as you know what's happening in the nearshoring. To your point, the Panama Canal is, 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 is going to be a, a problem for some time. And whatever's happening between the Suez, you know, that that's already happened, right? That I don't think there's any change in the in the patterns where you're going to see an unnatural spike from where we are today. In addition to the operational changes we saw many members of the supply chain take to overcome challenges they suffered during the pandemic, there were also policy changes for the first time since the 1980s. A coalition of industry participants, including truckers and shippers, urged Congress and the Federal Maritime Commission to adopt new rules that would govern the shipping industry. In 2021, the Ocean Shipping Reform Act was passed, the first major piece of legislation since the Shipping Act of the 1980s, and in 2022, there was clarifying language. This essentially was a new rule book on how members of the supply chain ecosystem would interact with one another to create fair dealings and a more balanced supply chain. Here's John Eisen, Executive Director of the American Trucking Association's Intermodal Motor Carriers Conference, discussing OSRA and the impacts it would have on the industry. Key pieces we saw was the passage of the Ocean Shipping Reform Act uh, last summer uh, through Congress. It went through on an almost uh, extraordinarily bipartisan basis. It was unanimous in the Senate and it got more than 360 votes in the House. Um, so it really did uh, the, the supply chain problems really captured the attention uh, of the Congress and led to uh, the passage of this legislation, which has turned out to be uh, very, very eventful, um, both in what the legislation said and I think in the message it delivered to regulators, uh, at the, especially at the Federal Maritime Commission, um, regarding the interest of policymakers uh, in what they were doing. I think in general, the, the FMC had not been something that had received a great deal of attention or focus uh, over the years. Um, and the, but the problems we saw uh, during the last year or so, year and a half, um, certainly focused the attention of Congress and the administration on the activities of the Federal Maritime Commission. And we have seen um, results because of it. In addition to the observations given by John Eisen, we had Federal Maritime Commissioner Max Vekic on talking about some of the new dispute resolution tools that the Ocean Shipping Reform Act provided to shippers as well. As you know, you can't always just change the practices, but if you have a better process to resolve issues amongst parties, you can actually get to the heart of what the issues are. Here's Max Vekic talking about some of the new tools under the Ocean Shipping Reform Act that the Federal Maritime Commission is very eager and has deployed throughout 2023. One of the things you're gonna see is the charge complaint uh, process is a real process now, and that's being um, that's proving quite popular. Shippers are really taking advantage of that, and uh, everywhere I go, I say, "Hey, if you have, do not overlook this tool. It is the best thing that's come your way in a long time, and you'll get action." And and I I think as a result of the the volume of um, now. Uh, complaints and concerns and cases filed, 
the industry's changed. The carriers have changed. They don't necessarily want to spend a lot of money on lawyers. And, and now the hubris is gone from their side to some large extent. It's not totally, uh, it's not totally gone, but, uh, but that's okay. That's okay. We need a level playing field. Another result of the Ocean Shipping Reform Act was newly bestowed powers on the Federal Maritime Commission, the entity that governs ocean shipping for the U.S. government. Federal Maritime Commission looked at OSRA as an opportunity to not just create balance and clarity, but to better understand who the players are and how to police them in a way that would result in benefits for the entire industry. Here's Commissioner Carl Bensel from the Federal Maritime Commission talking about the agreement process, antitrust, and other things that came out of OSRA outside of the dispute resolution process that will help them govern the industry moving forward to try to be proactive in making sure that there aren't unintended consequences. If you saw uh, the elimination of the antitrust immunity, you would see even more consolidation. You'd see some winners and losers at port levels. You know, I don't know what this would mean in, in, in a port like Oakland or, or other ports, which may stand to lose a major player at, at one of their term, uh, terminals. And so the port industry just doesn't want to deal with a lot of change in the structure of business or consolidation further. Um, so I'm, uh, I'm opposed to anything that would, uh, would transfer our authority uh, over agreements um, I have made recommendations uh, on the Hill with uh, Commissioner Vekage uh, to affirmatively have more authority to, uh, to evaluate agreements and approve them and disapprove them. Right now, we have to go to court to challenge them. One of the other key discussion topics was the migration of freight we saw in the middle of 2022 away from U.S. West Coast ports, now destined for U.S. East Coast and Gulf Coast ports as a result of prolonged labor negotiations between the International Longshore Warehouse Union, ILWU, and the Pacific Maritime Association, the PMA or Employers Association. Stephen Edwards, CEO of the Virginia Port Authority, talks about that migration of freight and his belief that the U.S. East Coast and Gulf Coast ports would be able to keep that market share moving beyond 2023. I think as a port now, we have five services coming in directly from Northwest India, for example. You turn the clock back, 10 years, it would have been one. So we're 500% of where we were, and those ships are all bigger. Then you're seeing the upsizing of ship capability. So our job as a port is to make sure we can handle those bigger ships. So the 13,000, 14,000 TU ships, because to get the efficiency of the Suez route, you have to be able to allow the shipping lines to deploy their best assets, and their best assets are going to be those larger ships. So to get to the slot cost advantage they can provide, we have to build those bigger capabilities. So we're investing in those capabilities we have 12 cranes, for example, on order here. Uh, we have a deeper, wider channel being, being built. We have a new berth that's going to be built. All of that is designed to say, we can handle your ultra-large container vessel to give you the economies of scale to come through the Suez Canal. Some of the discretionary freight, I mean, of other gateways may have picked up on and off from, from the West Coast. Some may go back, of course. But I don't actually think, I think the material shift is something that's been going on for more than a decade, and it's going to continue for a number of reasons which are to do with port efficiency, to do with gateways, but also to do with geopolitical issues as well of just where trade is moving to. And just as the West Coast was the beneficiary of the shift to Chinese production, the East Coast will be the beneficiary of that shift to Southeast Asia and, and South Asia production. However, many West Coast port executives have a difference of opinion. Many believe that yes, there has been a migration of freight over the last decade plus, from the West Coast to the Gulf and East Coast, but they would argue that there's just more freight coming through the gateways, and that actually a small percentage of it stays on the US East Coast or Gulf Coast once it's lost. And here's Dr. Noel Hasagaba from the Port of Long Beach talking about that migration back to the US West Coast. What we've been doing uh, and what we will continue to do is, to, is play the long game, right? Even during COVID, we continue to press forward with our capital uh, expansion programs. Why? Because we knew that this disruption, as severe as it was, at some point was going to end. And you, we, we kept the foot on the, on the gas. We continue to deliver. We delivered uh, LBCT, third phase. We delivered a new bridge. We're moving forward with our Peer Beyond Dock Rail Support Facility. 
It's things like that, Weston, that will continue to differentiate ports like ours because our customers will always know that this is where the capacity is. This is where the efficiencies are. This is where we have partners like Cargomatic and others who see what we're doing and they will pair their operations and their investments in innovation to match what we're doing and offer customers that value proposition. In fact, the prognostications that freight would indeed move back to the U.S. West Coast ports became reality. In Q3 of this year, we saw consecutive months of growth for the U.S. West Coast ports as a result of making sure that shelves were stocked for back to school and holiday items. Here's Chris Saltemeyer talking about that shift back to the U.S. West Coast. If I had a crystal ball or lens, I think that's the way we're headed. When we go back and start comparing the numbers now to what 19 looked like, you know, the first full non pand or the last full non pandemic year, you're seeing upticks in the market. You're seeing ocean freight up. You're seeing the markets move up from those um, positions. So I think we've moved out of it. And I feel like from a 24 standpoint, we're going to get more into a normal season, a normal cycle. But remember, Weston, the economy may lag because, as you know, the freight industry leads the economy. And so we will see stuff moving in the networks before the economy reacts. And so usually there's about a six month gap between us seeing movement in the economy and the actual economic numbers changing. And so I think we're starting to see that now. And I think we're going to see it manifest in 24. Expanding upon the notion of a migration of freight back to the U.S. West Coast ports, here are observations made in a recent conversation with Andrew Clark just about that very subject. You also have at play a couple of things you're talking about that naturally drive volume back to the West Coast. Um, for the folks that haven't relocated all their manufacturing someplace that creates a more conducive East Coast route, the shipping rates are much more competitive in the Trans-Pacific from Asia to the US, uh, with the LA Long Beach rates typically being the most competitive. Um, and then you also have the Panama Canal issue, which is some folks, their strategy was we'll go through the canal. Well, now they can't do that. So they're looking at U.S., West Coast, Canada, or Mexico, because the Suez Canal is really not an option it, once you get to a certain part of Asia, as you know. And all of that's happening, the state of California is saying, we're going to start retiring trucks and forcing people to replace them with zero emissions, which has had people leave the market which the last time there was a clean trucks program, 50% of the trucks did not re-enter the market over the next several years. And it was in a down market. People didn't see the value of doing it. So from my perspective, it's a long-winded way to say, there's a perfect storm opportunity where the most desirable gateway for international cargo will become again, Southern California because of all of the, the different aspects we've talked about. While we all know there was a massive migration of freight starting July of 2022 from the U.S. West Coast to the U.S. East and Gulf Coast ports as a result of that labor contract, Federal Maritime Commissioner and retired longshoreman Max Vekic talks about how there really was no labor disruptions this time around. The union worked in good faith without a contract, and he believes that those freight volumes will return to the U.S. West Coast because it's the most natural place for the freight to go. Yeah, no strike in 50 years. And, uh, you know, this contract that expired in 2022 was a three-year extension on top of a five-year contract. So it's been eight years since there's been any real negotiations. Um, and uh, uh, back when we voted to, uh, or talked about the extension of the contract, I was one of the loudest voices on the West Coast to extend the contract. Thought, no, we needed things, were, this is pre-pandemic, and uh, cargo, we needed to provide stability and certainty. And so uh, I thought the union was trying to do that by extending the contract. And, uh, <clears throat> and now since 2022, July 1, there's been no contract. So people are working without a contract. Um, that's a good thing. And uh, so the diversion of cargo, I think that's been um, a mistake. And I think uh, it'll all come back. As the year continued, we continued to see changes in the amount of jobs in the industry. As we discussed early in the year, there was right sizing from certain logistics companies who needed to hire as a result of the ballooning freight volumes they were handling throughout the pandemic. 
But in addition to layoffs, you saw a lot of mergers, acquisitions, and unfortunately bankruptcies. One of the largest being Yellow Freight. Here's Chris Saltmeyer talking about the bankruptcy of Yellow Freight. Yellow went through a very public bankruptcy here about two months ago. And just a really difficult situation when you think about the fact that 33,000 Yellow team members lost their jobs when that company went bankrupt. That company was actually a 99-year-old company, one year away from celebrating their 100-year anniversary. But it's one of those situations that if you have a company that doesn't have strong financial uh, a strong financial position, when you roll into a, a downturn like we've seen in the physical truckload market, if you're not in a real strong financial position, it's going to be really tough. On the heels of the news of the yellow bankruptcy, there were several other large scale bankruptcies announced in the industry, including convoy freight. However, not every bankruptcy was the direct result of being poorly managed. Many family owned and small trucking companies throughout the state of California had to close up shop due to the overreaching environmental policies the state of California is imposing on the industry. Here's American Trucking Association Executive Vice President Bill Sullivan talking about the challenges motor carriers face in the eyes of a down freight market and an increase in regulatory oversight. While we have sympathy with the attainment, Clean Air Act attainment in California, um, you know, something's got to give and there just isn't equipment out there. And our carriers are hearing who are, who are trying to electrify are being told by either the state quietly and secretly or by the power company, PG&E or others, that no, they can't have chargers because there's not enough electricity on the grid for the units. And, um, you know, I'd love to say there are roughly 40,000 stations across the country at which a truck can get clean diesel fuel. Um, there are 62 hydrogen fueling stations in the United States versus that 40,000, 61 of which are in California. And that's still not even enough, anywhere near what a, a robust network would be. Without a doubt, the most impactful new regulation on the industry is the Advanced Clean Fleets Rule, mandating a transition to zero emissions trucks starting January 1, 2024. Chris Shimoda, Senior Vice President of Public Policy for the California Trucking Association, discusses the impact this will have on California's trucking industry, specifically the firms going in and out of the state's seaports and rail ramps. If you are a fleet with more than 50 trucks, if you do greater than $50 million revenue and operate a single truck in the state of California, and that's a, a truck um, as low as 8,500 uh, gross vehicle weight rating and above, so your, your classic sprinter van size all the way up to class eights, um, or if you are a fleet of any size operating um, at intermodal ports and rail yards within the state, um, there is a rule, again, going to the board in April, that is going to require you to transition to zero emission technologies, either battery electric or hydrogen and fuel cell, as early as January 1st, 2024, which is, you know, about 10 months away at this point. Um, and I'll tell your audience just straight away, um, I do expect that this regulation is going to be adopted. Without a doubt, one of the major themes of 2023 was supply chain resiliency. Here's John Gold vice president of the national retail federation talking about what shippers need to do to ensure that there's they have a resilient and agile supply chain following many of the bottlenecks they saw during the pandemic that diversification is throughout the supply chain you've got to have that that match all along so you know you got to make sure you're sourcing folks you're talking to your transportation folks talking to supply chain so everybody understands what this whole process is going to look like from from end to end and that diversification goes beyond just the just in case of labor negotiations because i think as we've noticed something always happens in the supply chain that that leads to a disruption um you know again nobody thought that a a vessel would get stuck in the suez canal mm -hmm. um you know a couple of years ago and oh by the way we got one stuck on baltimore right after that dan walsh ceo of track intermodal the chassis leasing company joined us and talked about how everybody including members of his own family, have offered ideas on how to fix the supply chain. 
Yeah, let me explain to you what you need to do to fix <laughs> exactly. the supply chain. You know, there was a fair bit of that. Everyone had an opinion, even my auntie. You know, and, and I think... Um, People realise just how central it is to the way they want to live their lives. You know, they want to be able to say, hey, I want this, and then they expect it to come. And if it doesn't come, it's like, well, you know, how can that possibly be? You know, yeah. I can't live like that. And so there was there was a, a, a greater realisation, but with that came the burden of expectation. And I, I think, um, look, we, we, we stood up to it reasonably well. Not everything went perfectly, but we got through it. Now things are normalising, but it would be a crying shame if we didn't use the extra oxygen that we have now to make ourselves better and at least acknowledge that there's a bunch yep. of stuff that could be done way more efficiently than it's done now because it's done now how it was done 30 years ago and there's a million ways you can do it better. However, ideas mean nothing without the right type of support. Long Beach Congressman Robert Garcia joined us to talk about the importance the federal government plays in having a resilient supply chain, the major policy needs, the major investment needs, and really the overall support and championing needed by the federal government to make sure that we do have the world's most modernized and innovative supply chain. Kind of this kind of national approach to the supply chain is what we're focused on. We want to support, of course, local ports and innovation and, uh, um, and, and individual states and the infrastructure that's being built. But there's also, as you know, you can't really build a really large project without federal support. It's very difficult, whether it's a direct federal support or whether it's the state essentially spending the federal government's money that's a pass through to, to projects. I mean, all every major project is really a federal project. And so um, one of the things that we're looking at is not only how do we build um, and invest in traditional infrastructure type projects, but how do we also build kind of these like national communication systems uh, around ports, around the supply chain, around uh, all, all freight that's moving across uh, across the country, and, and what, what should federal investments look like, and what's the federal government's role in kind of moving those along or pushing those along. And so I think the federal government does have a role there. I mean, you're, you're able to take out the some of the competitive nature between kind of different points of the supply chain that, that occur across the country and be more of a um, uh, you know, a broader uh, kind of uh, advocate for for moving goods quicker, regardless of, of where they're coming in or what port they're coming in and where they're, where they're going out of. Putting a bow on this year's freight year in review, it looked much different than the previous years. In fact, many will tell you that 2023 should really be compared to 2019 as it was the last real baseline year, in which case we did okay. In fact, the country as a whole saw GDP growth, we saw jobs added, but the supply chain saw the lagging effects of overordering and over inventory. Now, as we head out of 2023 and into 2024, the supply chain has exhausted much of that inventory, worked on resiliency, and invested on having a much better supply chain from an end-to-end -end perspective. And as we look to turn the page into next year, it looks like it's gonna be a pretty good year, but, you're going to have to stay tuned when we come out with our 2024 predictions from our subject matter experts in the next edition of People on the Move. I'm Weston Labar, and we look forward to working together, moving your freight, moving America's freight in 2024.